Okay, well this morning and uh, next week, so for the next two weeks, we're going to be going to the Gospel of John. Um, this morning and during the first part of next Sunday service, we'll be looking at an overview of the entire Gospel. So this message and part of next Sunday will provide detail on the background, context, major themes, and events of John's Gospel. And then next week, we'll be looking at uh, the first 13 verses of chapter 1 of John's Gospel. In your personal study, if you've not been in the Gospel of John for a while, these next two weeks will give you a good head start into beginning that study. Hopefully this will get, uh, help you to get more out of your personal study should you decide to do that. So the message for this morning, the title for the message is an overview of the Gospel of John, and there's a five-part outline. Part one is the author of the Gospel. Part two is the date of the gospel and the historical context. Part three is the geographic setting and the significance of it. Four is a general overview of the gospel and application. And then part five, which we'll get to next week, is the purpose of John's gospel and why it was written. So the author, the date and the historical context, the geographic setting, an overview, and then next week, the purpose of John's gospel. So first part one, the author of the gospel. Now, as we talk about the author, I'm going to use the term to mean writer. We all know that the author of the entire Bible is the Holy Spirit. But both internal and external evidence points to John the Apostle as the author of the work. That John is the author is supported by early church fathers such as Polycarp, who lived from 60 to 155 AD. He knew John personally and was a disciple of John. Irenaeus who was a disciple of Polycarp, said that John wrote the gospel during his residence at Ephesus when he was advanced in age. And other church fathers testified of that also. Also, None of the authors of the other three gospels identify themselves as the author or the writer, and John doesn't either. But John's original readers clearly understood that he was the gospel's author. However, unlike the other three gospel authors, the author of John identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. This designation occurs four other times in the book, in chapters 13, 19, uh, 20, and again in 21. So right now would be a good time if you wanted to open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, if you haven't already. Each time I've read the Gospel of John and come to the phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved, I always wonder about that. Isn't that a bit presumptuous, John? Didn't Jesus love the other disciples as well? Actually, though, a more in-depth look at this phrase reveals John's true motives and why the, the phrase is there and why it's there repeatedly. The preference by John to identify himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved and to avoid his personal name is seen by many to reflect his humility. And this will become more clear as we progress through the message. It also speaks to his relationship with Jesus. Some see the, uh, John the Apostle as the most intimate earthly friend of Jesus. We'll take a closer look as to why this could have been the case. Also, as we move through part one, we're going to learn a lot about what kind of person John was and about the kind of person he became because of his association with Jesus. John's father was Zebedee, we're told in Matthew 4.21, and it appears his mother was Salome. Based on accounts in Matthew and Mark, Matthew chapter 27, Mark 15, and also based on an account in John chapter 19, the conclusion seems to be that Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Salome were sisters, which would have made the apostle John and Jesus cousins. Although we cannot be certain of that, many Bible teachers accept the identification of Salome as Mary's sister, and therefore John's mother. John and Jesus were about the same age, and would have known each other from childhood, and would have grown up together. This being the case, their friendship and closeness would have existed for many years before either one actually began their ministries. While Jesus loved all of his disciples and apostles, John would have had an especially close personal relationship with Jesus that ran much longer and deeper than any other disciple or apostle, referring to the human side of the relationship. 
This may be part of the reason that John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, but there's other reasons that we'll come to. Before we do, though, we need to change subjects for a minute and talk about John the Baptist and his relationship to both Jesus and John the Apostle. And it begins to get a little interesting here. John the Baptist's mother, Elizabeth, and Jesus' mother, Mary, were cousins, which made John the Baptist and Jesus kin, or relatives. John the Baptist was also close in age to Jesus, about six months older, so they too would have grown up knowing each other. If John the Apostle was a cousin of Jesus, as seems to be implied, then he was also a relative to John the Baptist. So John the Apostle, John the Baptist, and Jesus will all be part of the same extended family. They would have known each other since childhood, and at least to some degree would have grown up together. So please turn to chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, and we'll take a look at verse 33 and a few other verses after that. So chapter 1, verse 33. Beginning in verse 33, we learn that even though John the Apostle, John the Baptist, and Jesus would have grown up together and would have known each other since childhood, it's important to note that this does not mean that either one of the Johns knew Jesus as the Messiah or as God, or that they recognized him as God as they were growing up. In chapter 1, verses 33 and 34, John the Baptist said, I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So verse 33 means that John the Baptist did not previously know Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, but he certainly knew Jesus as a relative from their extended family relationship. And then further in verse 36, it says of John the Baptist, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Later in chapter 3, verse 30 of John, John the Baptist said of Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. Going back to John the Apostle, at some point he became a disciple of John the Baptist, and we see this in verses 35 through 40 of chapter 1. For example, look at verse 35. It says, John the Baptist is with two of his disciples. Verse 37 says, the two disciples heard him, John the Baptist, speak, and they followed Jesus. Well, who are these two disciples of John the Baptist who then followed Jesus? In verse 40, we learn that one of the two disciples being spoken of is Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And John the Apostle and author is actually the other disciple. He gives the name of Andrew in verse 40, but he does not identify himself as the other disciple or other apostle. He never uses his own name throughout the gospel. Based on the testimony of John the Baptist, John the Apostle, the son of Zebedee, was among those whom Jesus called by the Sea of Galilee. This is in Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 1. This makes John the Apostle one of the first disciples of Jesus, as we see in the verses just read. He became one of the first five disciples of Jesus, and he returned with Jesus to Galilee. The other four of the first five disciples that are listed in the rest of chapter 1 are Andrew, Simon Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. John the Apostle had a successful fishing business along with four other partners, and it seems John went back to his fishing business until about a year later, when Jesus called him to leave his business and go with Jesus in ministry. So as a review of these events, John the Apostle left John the Baptist as a disciple, and he became, becomes one of the first five disciples of Jesus. Later answering the call of Jesus, he leaves his fishing business, and from that point on, John was always with Jesus. Also, John was an eyewitness of all the things which he wrote in his gospel. Parts of the other gospels were taken from the witnesses of others, John personally witnessed all that he wrote about. Going back to the phrase John used of himself, the disciple whom Jesus loved, here's a list of 13 indications of the deep relationship the two had and why John was recognized as one of the closest to Jesus. John was one of the three inner circle apostles 
and one of the three most intimate of Jesus. The others were James and Peter. We see this in Luke chapter 6, Matthew chapter 17. John was one of the three apostles who were with Jesus at the Transfiguration, again along with James and Peter in Mark chapter 9. John was one of the three that Jesus took with him into the house of Jairus when he brought that man's daughter back to life, Mark 5 and Luke 8. John and Peter are instructed by Jesus to make preparations for the Passover in Luke 22. John was especially close to Jesus as indicated by the fact that he leaned on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper in John 13. Before Jesus' arrest, John was one of the inner circle of three he took to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even though the three were admonished for sleeping instead of watching in prayer, in that time of great difficulty when Jesus faced the prospect of death on a cross, it was to these three that he looked for for support. John is the only apostle whom the Bible places as an eyewitness to the crucifixion. And when Jesus was on the cross, it was to John that Jesus gave the charge to look after his mother Mary. We would have expected that Jesus would select one of his immediate family for this responsibility, one of his half-brothers, but his brothers did not believe in him up to the point of the crucifixion. Even after all the signs and miracles that Jesus performed, they still did not believe in him until after the resurrection. Well, John and Mary did believe in him, and this certainly shows a close relationship existed between Jesus and John. John was the first male to believe that Jesus rose from the dead or from death in chapter 20. John was the first to recognize him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee in chapter 21. John was the only one chosen by Jesus to write the book of Revelation in which Jesus appears to John in his glorified state. And in chapter 1 of Revelation, John describes him in verses 13 through 17. So all of this points to an especially close relationship between John and Jesus. However, there are indications that at first, John may not have appreciated fully who Jesus was and what he stood for. In addition to James and John being known as the sons of Zebedee, Jesus gave the name of Orangeres, or sons of thunder, in Mark chapter 3. So the creator of thunder names these brothers as sons of thunder. As I've come across this verse in the past, I've always seen it as sort of a lighthearted, or in a lighthearted way, maybe as a mild rebuke, where Jesus was calling attention to something these two brothers really needed to address. But think of the nature of thunder and what the sound of it does to people. Sometimes it strikes fear into people. Thunder could be the onset of a violent storm. When there is thunder, people seek shelter because lightning precedes thunder. Some in the early church actually understood this name as a compliment, thinking it meant that James and John's witness to Jesus would be as strong as thunder. However, most commentators see this as implying that these brothers had a vehement and violent temper which needed to be brought under control. John eventually did bring it under control and to a degree where his, uh, and to a degree where his previous violent temper was no longer part of who he was, and we'll see this later. One example that shows their temper or passion involves Samaritan villagers who refused to receive them as they traveled. When James and John heard of it, they asked Jesus whether he wanted them to call down fire from heaven to consume the villagers. And Jesus rebuked them and said in Luke chapter 9, verse 54, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. While their requests lacked a certain degree of love for their neighbors, it did demonstrate their passion and zeal for the Lord, maybe not all that different from the actions of other new Christians. John and James, though, failed to understand that the loving spirit that motivated their master was required of them as well. There's nothing wrong with passion, and many times it's a good thing, but it needs to be directed and controlled with love. Mark tells of an occasion when the sons of Zebedee asked Jesus for the two chief places in his kingdom, one to be on his right and the other on his left. Matthew has a point that the words were spoken by the men's mother but it leaves no doubt that John and James were in on it. So given these two examples and the fact that John wrote his gospel many years after the events took place, 
and he's now looking back on them. And he now has a more clear picture of the impact that Jesus had on his life. Here is the underlying reason why John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John wanted to emphasize the truth that it was the fact that Jesus loved him that made him what he was and what he eventually became. John recognized that he owed all that he had and all that he was to the love of Jesus. And don't we all? It was out of a deep sense of humility and appreciation that John uses the phrase. Yes, he had an especially close relationship with Jesus. Yes, there was a deep love between them that went back to their childhood and to their family relationship. And it continued in ministry as shown by all the examples. But the phrase shows a deep appreciation by John of all that Jesus forgave him of and of all that Jesus did for him despite his sinfulness. In this sense, John's use of the phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is motivated by the same sense of humility that Paul demonstrates when he refers to himself as the chief sinner in 1 Timothy 15. Both apostles are motivated by the same humility and thankfulness. And actually, each of us who have been forgiven of much could use the same phrase in the same way that John did. Forgive, forgiveness that we did not earn, forgiveness that we did not or do, and do not deserve, but forgiveness that we have nevertheless received from our forgiving and gracious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If part of the reason that John uses this phrase is also because he did not want to draw attention to himself by using his own name, then that would fit perfectly with John's humility and gratefulness. The Greek word for love that is used in all five verses where the phrase appears is agapa, agapeo. It means to love unselfishly to the point you'd be willing to sacrifice. It's the same word we find in John 3.16. In his book, 12 Ordinary Men, John MacArthur says this about the Apostle John. It may seem amazing that Jesus loved the man who wanted to burn up the Samaritans. He loved the man who was obsessed with status and position. He loved the man who forsook him and fled rather than suffer for his sake. But in loving John, Jesus transformed him into a different man, a man who modeled the same kind of love that Jesus had shown him. MacArthur also shared some of his own experiences. He said, the Apostle John reminds me of many seminary graduates whom I have known, including myself as a younger man. I recall that when I came out of seminary, I was loaded to the gills with truth, but somewhat short on patience. <laughs> it was a strong temptation to come blasting into the church, dump the truth on everyone, and expect an immediate response. <laughs> I needed to learn patience, tolerance, mercy, grace, forgiveness, tenderness, and compassion, all the characteristics of love. It is wonderful to be bold and thunderous, but love is, a, is the necessary balance. John is a superb man. John is a superb model for such young men. I can identify with that very much uh, when I first became a Christian. We'll finish up the section with a little more about the life of John the Apostle before we get to the next section of the message. John and Peter became the recognized leaders of the 12 apostles. John chapter 20, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 8, chapter 8, and are seen together in the book of Acts. After Jesus' ascension, John became a pillar in the Jerusalem church, and he continued to minister with Peter. Jerusalem seems to be, have been John's chief residence for a number of years. There's an inter-period of time where nothing is known of his activities or where he lived. However, it was at Ephesus that he wrote his gospel many years later, and from where the Romans exiled him to the island of Patmos because of his Christian testimony, where he lived in a cave, slept on a bed of rock, and wrote the book of Revelation. He was released from Patmos about 18 months, after about 18 months, by Emperor Nerva, uh, who ruled from 96 to 98, after which the apostle returned to Ephesus to resume his leadership there. In another quote from 12 Ordinary Men, John MacArthur says this about John the Apostle's final days. John died, by most accounts, around 98 during the reign of Emperor Trajan, 
Jerome says in his commentary on Galatians that the aged apostle John was so frail in his final days at Ephesus that he had to be carried to church. One phrase was constantly on his lips, my little children love one another. When asked why he always said this, John replied, it's the Lord's command, and if this alone be done, it is enough. So now, in his 90s, we see a very different John at the end of his life than the younger John who wanted to burn up the Samaritans. Love makes all the difference. So that completes our look at the Apostle John, the author of the Gospel and who he was. Now we'll take a look at the date and timing of John's Gospel. So part two, the date and the historical context. As we explore the date of the gospel, the date the gospel was written, we're going to do that within the historical context of what was going on within the church at that time. While there are different opinions as to when John wrote his gospel, conservative scholars typically date the book between AD 85 and 95, with the year 90 being the date with the most consensus. So John wrote his gospel about 50 to 60 years after he witnessed Jesus' earthly ministry was part of it. Portions of John's Gospel were among the scraps of papyrus found in Egypt in 1935. This fragment called the Rylands Papyrus was written around AD 125 and it contains portions of John chapter 18 verses 31 to 33, 37 and 38. For those who say the Gospel was written much later during the second century, and there are some who do say that, this find disproves this theory because much time was needed for John's gospel to be copied and then carried to Egypt. So this supports an earlier time of the gospel being written around AD 90. But why was John's gospel written so long after the first three synoptic gospels? Everything in the Bible has a purpose in being there. Every event, every person, every word, the order of the books in the Bible, all of it has a purpose. There's nothing in the Bible that's there without a purpose. It's all divinely ordained. The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were written approximately in the years 50 to 60 AD. John's gospel was sort of the straggler in that it was written 30 to 40 years after the first three gospels were written. So why the large gap in time between John's gospel and the other three? The Bible does not address the question directly, but it does provide insight into the significance of the timing. The timing has a purpose. There are at least two reasons for the timing of the Gospel of John. The first reason is to strengthen believers given the persecution they were dealing with at the close of the first century. As we look at the, fir at the first reason, we're going to refer to the second epistle of Peter, the first epistle of John, and the epistle of Jude. These books provide a more complete picture as to the overall spiritual condition of the church at the time the Gospel of John was written and what was going on at that time. In Peter's second epistle in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Peter warns believers that there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Peter urges believers to keep a close watch on their personal lives and to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. The statement and warning by Peter is the best protection against falling for false doctrine. That's by growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That'll protect us against false doctrine. The warning that Peter gave in 2 Peter of the coming false teachers had become in Jude's time a reality. Jude is now, about 10 years later, confronting both the reality and the spread of apostasy. It is rapidly permeating and infecting the church, which is what Peter warned of about 10 years earlier. Jude issues a wake-up call to the church, to believers. In Jude, verses 3 through 5, Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith was, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turned to the grace, who turned the grace of God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God in our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, 
that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Jude, in the strongest terms, exhorts them to contend for and fight for the faith and against the rapid rise of false teaching. This teaching has as its ultimate goal the denial and rejection of Jesus as the only Son of God and as a Messiah. One type of false teaching during Jude's time that is still prevalent today said that there was a small group of spiritual elite who were saved by what they know, not who they know. They taught that the larger majority of common people who were not among the spiritually elite could never reach the height of knowledge needed to be saved. Another type of false teaching says that for a certain group, the law is dead and that they are under grace. They can do it absolutely whatever they want. Grace is supreme and it can forgive any sin. The more the sin, the more the opportunities are for grace to the palm. So Peter warned about all of this around 65 AD. Jude was dealing with the reality and rapid spread of it about 10 years later. And the Apostle John also addressed it about 20 years after Jude in his first epistle written from Ephesus around 95 AD. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 through 19, and then 23, 22 to 23, and the t subtitle in my Bible refers to this section as Deceptions of the Last Hour. In verses 18 and 19, John says, Little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Verses 22 to 23, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. But how did all this heresy happen so quickly? About 50 to 60 years after the resurrection, the church is infected with all of this heresy. False teaching was flourishing and spreading within the church after only 50 or 60 years. How did all this false teaching come to have such a large influence and impact on the church? And how and why did it happen so quickly after the resurrection? William Barclay said in his book, The Letters of John and Jude, so the letters of John and Jude said this regarding what was going on around the time period. And his comments are about John's first epistle, but they apply to the overall time period. So he said, by 100 AD, certain things had almost inevitably happened within the church. Many were now second or even third generation Christians. The thrill of the first days had, to some extent at least, passed away. He goes on to say, in the first days of Christianity, there was glory and a splendor but now Christianity had become a thing of habit, traditional, half-hearted, and nominal. Men had grown used to it, and something of the wonder was lost. They did not want to be saints in the New Testament sense of the term. They did not want to be holy or set apart. The standards demanded by Christianity had become a burden. It demanded a higher ethical standard, a higher standard of moral purity, and of kindness, of service, of forgiveness, and all of this was more difficult to live by. And once the first thrill and enthusiasm were gone, it became harder and harder to stand out against the world and to refuse to conform to the generally accepted standards and practices of the age. Barclay goes on to say that the false teaching of this time did not come from men out to destroy the Christian faith, but it came from men whose aim it was to make Christianity intellectually respectable. They wanted to improve it. They knew the intellectual tendencies and currents of the day and felt that the time had come for Christianity to come to terms with secular philosophy and contemporary thought. The nature of this philosophy and thought leads directly to various kinds of false teaching. Doesn't that sound eerily familiar to what we're seeing and have seen? And there is nothing new under the sun. The preacher said, King Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. One last comment from Barclay regarding the warning in 1 John. 
It needs to be noted that 1 John shows no signs that the church to which it was written was being persecuted. The peril was not persecution, but seduction. It came from within. So that's the end of the quote from William Barclay. However, it needs to be said that even though John does not mention persecution in his first epistle, there were believers who were suffering persecution and conflict. Different groups within the church held wrong ideas about who Jesus was, and unbelievers from outside the church persecuted Christians. Persecution from outside the church and false teaching from within led to much conflict and trials for true believers within the church. Again, very similar, if not identical, to what we're seeing today. One other thing to keep in mind about the end of the first century is that many, if not all, the original disciples would have died, along with 11 of the 12 apostles. John MacArthur said this about the period of time that Jude wrote. Except for John, who lived at the close of the first century, <clears throat> all of the other apostles had been martyred, and Christianity was thought to be extremely vulnerable. The aggressive spiritual infiltration of false teachers could be the forerunner to full-blown Gnosticism, which the Apostle John would confront over 25 years later in his epistles. So taking all of this into consideration, during the last 25 years of the first century, things are not looking real good for the true Christian church. There were not many people who were willing to, to lead the disciplined life required of a true Christian. Not many were willing to die to self daily. Not many were willing to take up their cross every day and follow Jesus. Half-hearted and nominal Christians who seemed to make up the majority had in effect created a vacuum into which false teaching and heresy rushes in. It rushes in, it fills the vacuum, it takes root, and it flourishes and spread like wildfire. Within the context of false prophets arising and deceiving many and of the lawlessness abounding, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, the love of many people will grow cold. So the challenge for us, brothers and sisters, as we live in the 21st century, is not to become like most people at the end of the first century, as many are today. There is ongoing discipline and assistance needed to live a Christian life the way the Bible commands, but by Jesus' example. Discipline and persistence born out of love and humility and a desire to obey with the help of the Holy Spirit. Each day we need to kill the works of the flesh so that the works of the Spirit can shine through. Each day and throughout the day we need to submit our will to His will. This all takes willingness and effort. It will not happen on its own because our flesh does not want it to. We are not going through anything today that other Christians haven't gone through before us. With the Lord's help they persevered, they kept their eyes on Jesus, and they were faithful. The same help is available to us, and the same perseverance is required of us. So to get back to the question of why the Gospel of John is written 30 to 40 years after the other three synoptic Gospels, given everything that was taking place within the church around the year 90, the weak state of Christianity, the significant rise and impact of false teaching, which has at its chief aim the denial and rejection of Jesus as the only Son of God, and to all of this mess, the Gospel of John appears on the scene. The Gospel of John is, above all else, about the deity of Jesus Christ. It is John. In it, John presents eight signs or miracles to prove beyond any doubt that Jesus is who he says he is, and that he is the Son of God and the Messiah. Only God can do the things that are testified of in the Gospel of John. By arriving on the scene at this time, it would have dealt a huge blow to those who were rejecting Jesus as God and teaching others to do the same. The timing of the Gospel of John strengthened the faith of those who had already believed but were facing growing opposition and false teaching. It would have given the church at that time a huge shot in the arm to strengthen their faith and help them to contend with the false teachers. It also provided powerful testimony to help lead non-believers away it provided a powerful testimony to help lead non-believers away from false teaching toward belief in Jesus and toward eternal life. A second reason for the timing of the Gospel of John is this. The Gospel of John appears on the scene about five years before what would become the most horrific time of Christian persecution and torture in history up to that time. 
There had been some ongoing persecution of Christians already, but it grew much worse in year 95 under the Roman Emperor Domitian. He was the brother and successor of Emperor Titus who destroyed Jerusalem. It was Domitian who banished John to a prison community on the island of Patmos. The intense persecution began by, began by Domitian continued for over 200 years until Constantine issued the Edict of Toleration in AD 313. This edict granted to Christians and to all others the full liberty of following the religion of their choosing. During the 200 year period of persecution though, one commentator said that every form of torture that evil minds could come up with were devised and used on Christians. That was the time when Christians were fed to lions, they were impaled on stakes, used as human torches, and many other horrific forms of torture were used against them. As the church enters this period of time at the close of the first century, it was in a state of decline and it was greatly influenced and weakened by false teaching. But now it had the most powerful and convincing proof that Jesus is who he said he was. John's gospel appears on the scene just in time and it greatly strengthens the faith of believers as they endure horrible persecution for his name and for his glory. Persecution has the effect of purifying and strengthening the church. It was during this 200 year period that the church grew to number in the millions. In the catacombs of Rome, the number of Christian graves are estimated to be somewhere between two and seven million. The church grew to the point where at the end of the imperial persecution in 313, it is estimated that about one half of the population of the Roman Empire was Christian. So that's some of the background on the significance of John's gospel, the date of it, and the significance of the date that it was written. We'll move on to the geographic setting and the significance of the setting. In this section, we'll talk about the importance of the, the geographic setting of the gospel, but also the geographic setting of the writing of the gospel. Regarding the setting of the gospel itself, John's major geographical focus was on Jerusalem. Although Jesus moved throughout the surrounding areas, he always returned to Jerusalem, specifically to participate in various temple feasts. For example, in John chapter 2, Jesus returned from the Jordan and from Cana of Galilee to the feast of the Passover. In John chapter 5, his trip to the Jordan, Samaria, and Cana of Galilee ended with his return to another feast, which is unknown. In John chapter 6, John linked Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 in the wilderness to the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. In John chapter 7, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for the Festival of Tabernacles. In John 11, after raising Lazarus in Bethany, which is just over the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem, Jesus returned to Jerusalem in chapter 12 for his final Passover. So why is all this worth mentioning? Because the geographical focus on Jerusalem and its feasts supports John's purpose, which was to reveal that Jesus was and is the fulfillment of all of the feasts, and especially that he alone represented the perfect Passover Lamb of God. Around Jesus alone, and not the temple with its festivals, but around Jesus alone are believers to worship, celebrate, and find their redemption. Regarding the geographic setting at the time the gospel was written, which was again around 90 AD, external tradition is very strong that John came to Ephesus after Paul had founded the church there, and that John labored in that city for many years. Supporting the tradition uh, is the evidence of Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. When John was in exile on the island of Patmos, he wrote to the seven Asian churches, the first of which was Ephesus. And it's very probable that John's gospel was originally published at Ephesus. So now we'll move into section four of the outline, which is an overview um, of the gospel. In the overview of John, we'll talk about some of the characteristics of his gospel that make it unique from the others. In a very meticulous way, John records the statements and describes the miracles of Jesus that only God himself can do. Also, John supplied a large amount of unique material not recorded in the other Gospels. He often supplied information that helps in the understanding of the events in the Synoptic Gospels. For example, in Mark 6.45, after the feeding of 5,000, Jesus compelled his disciples to cross the Sea of Galilee through Bethsaida. 
But in John 6, 26, John tells us the reason. The people were about to make Jesus king because of his miraculous feeding of the multitude, and he was avoiding their badly motivated efforts to do this. The first three Gospels mainly focus on describing the events in the life of Christ, but John focused on the meaning of these events. All four Gospels record the feeding of, 5, 000, of the 5,000, but only John records Jesus' sermon on the bread of life, which followed that miracle, when he interpreted it for the people. John's Gospel contains the largest amount of teaching of the Holy Spirit. Only in John's Gospel do we learn of the length of Jesus' ministry, which was about three and a half years, by counting the Passover feasts. John's Gospel explains the one who came to reveal the Father. So here are some major differences between the Gospel of John and the other three synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as known as the three synoptic Gospels, synoptic means see together. The first three Gospels present Jesus' life in pretty much the same format. The first three focus more on what Jesus taught and did. John focuses more on who Jesus is and on his deity. Every chapter presents evidence, both signs and statements, for his deity. The synoptic writers, as well as John, present a divine Messiah. But John's Gospel is so clear and pointed in his teaching on Christ that it greatly enriched the church. For example, the text... The word became flesh in John 1, 14, became the central focal point for the early church father's meditation and study. John presented the incarnation, God manifested in the flesh, as the foundation of the gospel. There are significant events in the ministry of Jesus that Matthew, Mark, and Luke include, but that John does not include. And these are Jesus' birth and his baptism, his temptation in the wilderness, the Last Supper, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, his ascension, demonic confrontations, and parables. However, there are stories about people in, that John includes that are not included in the other Gospels, such as Nicodemus, the woman at the well, and Lazarus. These stories are highlighted in John. John's Gospel contains 93% original material when compared to the Synoptic Gospels. The first three Gospels center on Jesus' ministry in Galilee, in the region of the Sea of Galilee. As was mentioned, John centered his gospel on what Jesus said and did in Jerusalem, which is about 80 miles south and around the northern region of the Dead Sea. All the gospels, of all the gospels, John's is not meant to be a chronological account of Jesus' life. Instead, it focuses on the significance of his death, a reality which is present right from the beginning of the gospel in chapter one, verse 29. The call to faith and the promise of eternal life are repeatedly stressed. John shows us who Jesus is by highlighting eight signs or miracles of Jesus. Six of these miracles are not mentioned in the first three Gospels. So we'll conclude this section by looking at, um, however, it needs to be noted, it needs to be noted that each Gospel is critical and important to understanding everything about Jesus that the Holy Spirit wants us to understand. By the design of the Holy Spirit, each gospel reveals, reveals something different and unique about who Jesus was. Matthew shows in chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 1 through 17, the lineage of Jesus beginning with Abraham through David and finally through Joseph. He demonstrates that Jesus is the King of the Jews and a long-awaited Messiah promised in the Old Testament. In Mark 1, 9, he shows that Jesus came from Nazareth, a town that did not have an especially good reputation. That's in John 1, 46 demonstrating that Jesus came from humble beginnings and came to serve. It portrays him as an active, compassionate, and obedient servant. In Luke chapter 3, he shows that Jesus came from Adam. His humanity and compassion are repeatedly stressed. He is a perfect human being. John shows that Jesus came from heaven, demonstrating that Jesus is God. So as we close out the message this morning, here are some thoughts toward applying it. As stated earlier, the challenge for us as we live in the 21st century is not to become like most people at the end of the first century, and as many are today. There is ongoing and daily discipline and persistence needed to live the Christian life the way the Bible commands. Discipline and persistence that are born out of love and humility and the desire to obey with the help of the Holy Spirit. Just as the first century church entered a period of intense persecution, 
we in the 21st century could be entering into a similar period of persecution. All of us need to strengthen our faith. Let the Gospel of John strengthen your faith as it did the first century Christians. It's one of the church's jobs to warn people of coming persecution. Christian persecution is and has been occurring, and given current trends, it will certainly increase. Strengthen your faith by being in the Word regularly and frequently. But remember that we are a people of faith, not of fear. And while what we believe in is under attack, there is also good news. The battle is already won, and we know what happens, and we know who wins. Thank you, man. We need to be strong and stand strong in our God and on his word. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So next week we'll continue with the fifth section of the outline again, which is the purpose of John's gospel. And then we'll get into the first three or first 13 verses of chapter 1, in case you'd like to read it. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for the gift of your son, Jesus, for the sacrifice of your son on the cross and his resurrection so that we can have eternal life and be reconciled with you. Thank you, Father, again for the gospel of John. We pray, Lord, we would take these words and take this message, apply it to our lives, and that, Lord, we would stand strong in you and we would be strong in, in faith in your word and that we would be example and witnesses to others of your love and your grace and your mercy. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.